Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so good to see everybody. I am Jacqueline Fuller from Google.org, and I'm here today with Josh Cohen from Apple University and Jennifer Eberhardt here uh, from Stanford. And so our panel time today is going to reflect on new sources of data, um, corporate so sources of data um, in Josh's world, entirely new sources of data with um, body cams with police and data coming from police departments in Jennifer's case. And uh, we're going to look at that through the lens of what are the policy implications and what are the broader implications for wanting to take action based on these new data sources. So first we have Josh Cohen. He's on the faculty of Apple University, a distinguished senior fellow in law, philosophy, and political science at UC Berkeley, and since 1991 has been the editor of the Boston Review. He's a political philosopher, and he's written on deliberative democracy and global justice, and he's currently researching issues about labor standards in global supply chains. He's an author of many books, and he's taught at Stanford and MIT. And uh, Josh and I know each other uh, from some work that done together with Google.org, yeah. so good to see you again. Nice to see you. So Jennifer, Jennifer Everhart received her BA from the University of Cincinnati and a PhD from Harvard University. She's taught at Yale in the departments of psychology and African and African American studies. She joined the Stanford faculty in 1998 and is currently an associate professor in the department of psychology and the co-director of SPARC. Do you see the Q? SPARC? Yes. Um, I can explain it. Which is a university initiative to use psychological research to address social problems. Uh, her bio doesn't mention this, but she's also received a MacArthur Genius Award, which uh, I would make sure that I mentioned at every opportunity in my life <laughs> and at every cocktail party um, that I ever attended in perpetuity. <laughs> so with those brief introductions, I'll invite uh, Josh to, oh, okay. to start. <laughs> All right. Okay, you I'll got, start. <laughs> yeah. And if you'd prefer, you prefer, prior can, agreement. Okay. Yes, you can use the podium if, uh, if that's more comfortable or whatever works okay. for you. I'll do that. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a social psychologist uh, here at Stanford, and I'm also the uh, co-director of SPARC, uh, which does stand for Social Psychological Answers to Real World Questions. And um, we are um, sort of uh, a center designed to bring researchers and um, practitioners together to you know, address the social problems. And um, I study, um, as a social psychologist, I study race and inequality in a variety of contexts. <clears throat> But uh, today I want to talk to you about race and inequality in the policing context and uh, talk about a, a project that I'm working on actually with Spark and with the uh, Oakland Police Department. Um, now, the Oakland Police Department has um, been under federal oversight for about uh, 13 years uh, now. Um, and that federal oversight uh, in part was um, uh, due to what's known as the Ryder scandal. I don't know if any of you guys are from around here and remember this scandal, but it was a scandal that involved um, four uh, Oakland police uh, officers uh, who beat and uh, planted drugs on uh, people and then uh, falsely accused them of crimes. And there was a class action lawsuit filed uh, which involved 119 people uh, who said they were abused by the police and many of them served uh, time in, in prison um, under uh, false allegations. And of those 119 people who served, uh, some of them who were involved and some of them who served time, 118 of them were African American. And uh, the city of Oakland paid out about $11 million to settle the lawsuit. Um, and a negotiated settlement agreement was um, also uh, put into place to uh, uh, start the process of reform uh, in Oakland. And that negotiated settlement agreement is still uh, in place uh, 13 years later. Uh, now, many of the um, requirements uh, for reform on that uh, settlement have been addressed, but uh, the department is still struggling uh, to comply with um, the part of the agreement which involved uh, addressing, resolving, and reducing incidents of racial profiling and bias-based policing. About a year and a half ago, I was hired uh, as a subject matter expert to help the OPD comply uh, with this order. And so that's uh, kind of how we uh, became connected. 
Um, then I brought together a team of people at Stanford, uh, 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 Spark affiliates, to work with me on this. And together, we've begun to analyze data on stops and uh, searches to see if there are racial disparities there. And then we're also using uh, body camera footage uh, from those stops and searches to um, try to understand police community uh, interactions and whether those interactions seem to be differing by race. Uh, the department has had these cameras for about four years now. Um, and they have about 700 uh, sworn officers, and practically all of these officers have the cameras. And so now they have hundreds of thousands of uh, files of footage um, uh, containing uh, interactions of, of stops and searches and uh, calls for service and all kinds of contact that the police would make with um, uh, community members in Oakland. Um, as a result of uh, the more recent cases over the past year, like the uh, case of Michael Brown and Eric Garner and Tamir Rice, and uh, Sandra Blonde and Freddie Gray, um, law enforcement agencies are being um, called upon you know, all across the country to wear uh, uh, body cameras. So community members want those cameras because they want to be, uh, they want accountability, they want to be able to uh, document uh, police wrongdoing. And uh, now police officers are um, increasingly wanting these cameras because they want to be able to uh, protect themselves from false allegations and lawsuits. Um, now, this is all um, good, and this is you know, perhaps you know, a good use of the cameras. But um, what we want to uh, focus on uh, with the project that we're uh, working on is that, that the cameras can do more than be used to just uh, protect or indict. Um, and in fact, we can use all the data, all the footage from these cameras to um, actually try to make headway on improving uh, relations with the police. And so the idea is that we can start to think um, about this um, footage uh, more as data uh, than uh, just thinking about it as courtroom evidence. Um, and right now, the typical approach to looking at this data um, is to look at it one tape at a time to uh, try to uh, assess who was right or who was wrong in a particular instance. Um, um, and the idea that we have is that we can also uh, look at this footage um, across thousands of videotapes and, and, uh, and in the aggregate um, uh, look to see whether officers do in, indeed treat um, African Americans, for example, differently from other groups, whether there's a more negative tone or, or, or pitch to the voice in these interactions, whether these um, vocal qualities or whether these linguistic cues um, can be used to accurately predict um, how the interaction is going to unfold. Um, and so by looking at the footage in this way, we could um, also uh, uh, come to more fully appreciate cases where things go right, um, which we don't really hear about on the news so much. So where there's um, th th you know, cases where the interactions aren't negative at all, or cases where the officers have been able to successfully de-escalate conflict. Um, so this footage has enormous value for training purposes, which it's not being used uh, for as much, nearly as much as it could be for that purpose. And the footage also holds enormous value for training evaluation. Um, so, are we, are we, we're, oh, I'm almost done. Okay. Oh, how, how much Good. time? Do I have a couple minutes? <laughs> well, you're a little bit over your seven. So, I am? Yeah. Really? I know. Okay. You get so excited for, with. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, all right, so, um, so I'll wrap up in a second. I just want to say that um, the uh, footage also has uh, value for training evaluation. So um, given everything that's going on in the country right now, uh, people want to know how police officers are being trained, and uh, they want them to be trained to have better interactions right, with the public. And last year, uh, President Obama um, put together a task force on 21st century policing, and um, I visited that task force and heard testimony from person after person saying how uh, they want procedural justice training. It's the training that is designed to help officers um, interact better with the public by um, you know, sort of treating them uh, better during the process rather than focusing on the outcome um, of, of the interaction. So um, the idea is that uh, the procedures that officers are using during the interaction matter as much to people um, as uh, what the outcome of the interaction, so as it would uh, if the person got a ticket, say, at the end of that interaction. And, um, and so um, there, there are all these trainings that are designed to help officers to, um, um, you know, to, to uh, help, help the um, 
the, the people that they're stopping uh, feel like they're trustworthy and to give people voice and to treat them with respect and, and so forth. But, but there's a lot of things that get in the way and, and one of those barriers to achieving procedural justice is implicit bias. And so mm -hmm. that's why people want um, training both on procedural justice and implicit bias. And there's a lot of evidence um, for this work, um, but what we have little evidence for is whether the trainings uh, that officers are receiving on this um, mm -hmm. actually um, make a difference. And in fact, um, um, the only way, or the typical way that they evaluate those trainings now is just by asking officers at the very end of the training whether they like the training. Mm. And so, as social scientists, <laughs> you know, we feel like we could do more uh, than that, right? And so one of the uses of the body camera footage is to um, look at the officer's footage pre and post training um, to see if the interactions are um, improving, if they are getting better, if the lessons they're learning in the uh, classroom are, if they're translating that to their, um, their uh, work on the street. So Perfect. I'll just stop there. Yeah. That was Thanks. great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much, All Jennifer. Right. All right. Go ahead. All right. Thanks for reminding me that I got a ticket this morning already. Oh no! <laughs> a ticket and a flat tire in one in one uh, week. Yesterday it was a flat tire. Today ah. it's a ticket. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you all for being here. So, um, in uh, January 2013, Apple formed an academic advisory board on labor standards. Uh, the board is composed of uh, eight academics, economists political scientists, sociologists, and doctors. One member of the board, Anne Oaks Axenian, is right here. Margaret Levy is another member of the uh, board. All people with expertise on issues about labor and global supply chains. Uh, one, and one purpose of this advisory board is to commission new research that might contribute to the improvement of labor standards in Apple suppliers. The understanding is that the research is publishable though with a commitment to preserving supplier confidentiality. So in my the remarks I'm going to make today, I'm going to discuss the research and preserve the confidentiality. And I, I emphasize, I mean, I'm an Apple employee, but I'm uh, speaking as a researcher involved in this project. I'm in no sense speaking for Apple. Though I should add that, uh, as well that the board and the research it's commissioned is unique, completely unique in the world of exploring labor issues in uh, global supply chains. So in the earliest meetings, the board identified the issue of high worker turnover as a research topic. Turnover in some suppliers was running in the range of 5 to 7 percent per week. And the choice of topic was guided by three assumptions. The first was there must be something wrong. That was the first assumption that people are leaving that quickly. The second assumption was that turnover of that magnitude might have a bad impact on factory operations, on training and hiring costs, as well as product quality and product volume. The third assumption, and the most important one, was that high turnover would undermine the mutual knowledge and trust needed for workers to develop collective voice and to pursue the collective action that they need in order to protect and advance their own uh, interests. So I took the lead in early 2014 in putting together a team of researchers, mostly not Apple employees, though mostly compensated by Apple for their work, to pursue the project. The group includes sociologists, economists, political scientists, and biostatisticians from Stanford, LSE, Berkeley, Columbia, and Apple. Uh, we have lots of data, uh, administrative data, on nearly a million workers at a few very large facilities. We have production data from Apple with 19 million observations. We've conducted 30-minute surveys of uh, 15,000 new hires at two facilities, an exit survey of about 1,000 group conversations of roughly an hour with several hundred workers, and three experiments in one facility with more on the way. It's a very unusual project in the labor area in terms of the extent of the data, the data sources, and the potential for large impact. I emphasize the word potential, but also the phrase large impact. With more than 3 million workers in the Apple supply chain in China each year, the impact could be big. So to convey the, convey the flavor of the research, I'm going to uh, sketch two findings, one based on observational data on 280,000 workers over 13 months at one facility, the second based on an experiment we've been conducting at the same facility. And I picked these two because they're both analytically interesting and because they raise challenging practical and ethical issues. First, 
our original speculation was that if you, you're losing 5 to 6% of your workers each week, uh, that would result in high costs, including troubles in factory operations. So we studied the impact of worker exit on individual assembly lines in a particular facility. Specifically, we examined the impact on product yields on both iPhones and iPads. Product yield, I can explain it if anybody's interested. It's a basic measure of product quality. We had 19 million observations on the production side and about 2 million person weeks. Uh, we found no impact. Zero. Flatline. Product yields are very high and they flatline even with one, two, and three sigma shifts in exit rates. How could that be? How do you buffer quality from high exit? Well, you might slow down the production lines. When lots of people leave, protecting quality but reducing volume. No evidence for that, certainly not on the iPhone lines. A second way is to simplify tasks so much that when somebody leaves, somebody else who has a pulse can replace them. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence for this strategy in lean production. It's called pokayoki, mistake proofing. Third approach is to rely on some workers who stay longer, learn multiple jobs, and can step in when people are absent or leave. The right story is a mix of the second and the third, though again, we see very little evidence for the third, that is the importance of the experienced workers on some products. The key buffer in the production of very high volumes of very high quality products is the simplification of tasks. Because these buffers work so well, the purely commercial case for reducing worker exit is weak. Case gets stronger when labor supply is tight, whether for economic or demographic reasons, but enough, if enough people are coming in through the front door to cover the people who are leaving through the back door, then the commercial case is not very compelling. Policies that reduce exit may be good for workers, but life is not win-win. The main reasons for reducing worker exit are ethical. The ethical principle, in a nutshell, is that workplaces should not be producing mass flight. Do those ethical reasons have practical force? We'll see. Second, I'll describe an experiment that we have fresh data on. Purpose of the experiment was to test a finding from the observational data, again on 280,000 workers employed over a 13-month period, about the effects of, on, of skill bonuses on exit. The firm where we conducted the experiment currently has a policy of letting workers take a skill test after three months, six months, and nine months. If you pass the test, you get a bonus equal to 2.5% of base salary for each test, so up to 7.5% if you pass all three tests. In the experiment, we have 2,400 workers, half controls, the other half in three treatments. The controls have the status quo, tests and bonuses at three, six, and nine months. One treatment is you just give a letter to people and you say, the firm has the status quo policy because it's making an investment in people who work here. The second treatment puts workers on a fast track, one month, two months, and three months instead of three, six, and nine months. The third treatment, you can see where this is going, is you get the fast track, one month, two months, and three months, and you get the letter saying the firm is doing this because the firm makes an investment in workers. Two interesting findings from this experiment. First, we see almost no difference between the controls in the status quo and the fast track groups. Not because there's no effect, but because there are two competing effects. People who pass the test are more likely to stay than the controls who don't take the test. But some people fail the test, and people who fail the test are more likely than the controls to leave. Both of those effects are good for the firm. What you have is a screen on ability and a motivation for people who stay, an incentive to stay if you pass the test. So, is it a, so it's a good thing for the firm. Is the test a good thing for workers? Less clear. Second, consider the people who just get the letter reframing the status quo as an investment by the firm in workers. They have the lowest rate of exit of any group, controls or treatment. 
because they're not subject to the ability screen. They can't fail a test because they're not given the test. So if the central goal is to reduce exit so that workers can develop a collective voice, maybe the right recommendation based on this experiment, and I made it on Monday at the supplier, maybe the right recommendation is to send everybody a letter. Doesn't seem like much. But if it motivates people to stay, then workers will be in a better position to develop the collective voice and collective action that's important to defending and advancing their own interests. And uh, that's why the research team is in this business. All right. Thanks so much, Josh. All right, I'm going to dive in with a few questions, and you all can be uh, thinking, thinking about your own. So let me, let me start with you, Jennifer, and um, let me ask a sort of wider lens question, but then also narrow in a little bit on specifics. Okay. Um, we'll take them one at a time, but I'm going to give you both up front. So okay. wide lens is just thinking about the balance between privacy and transparency with this kind of data. I can imagine that um, the police uh, has an opinion Mm -hmm. about when to release and in right. what situations, whether officers get to see it right. ahead of time or not. I think the public might have a competing view. Mm -hmm. uh, so just how do, you, how do you balance that in this situation? That's, so that's the wide view. And then narrowing in a bit, I'm going to ask you about um, unconscious bias in general and implicit um, bias mm -hmm. and, uh, and the evidence for that and how that relates to your, your specific work. So let's do, let's do wide <coughs> first. Okay, so why, yeah, so there is a tension right now uh, between uh, privacy and transparency. So, I mean, as I uh, mentioned in my uh, remarks, uh, a lot of people, um, you know, they, they want, you know, the uh, cameras and they want to uh, be able to see the footage uh, produced by the cameras because, um, you know, they want accountability. Um, so, um, so you, so you have that side, uh, but then you also have the privacy side where, you know, they're taking footage of, 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 of people and, mm -hmm. and some police departments are even putting this footage on the web. Some, some people um, give uh, the footage out uh, if it's requested through a public information uh, request um, and some mm -hmm. departments don't. So there isn't um, a, a consistent uh, mm -hmm. policy across uh, uh, law enforcement agencies right now about what to do, um, but there's certainly uh, this tension there because Agencies want to be transparent, but they, then they also, well, sometimes they want to be transparent, and, but then there's also this uh, issue of, of privacy. So how do you balance it? Um, with, with, with our work, uh, so one way that yeah. people are doing this uh, is actually by um, um, trying to uh, figure out ways to redact the footage yeah. um, and then make it available. Um, it's a lot easier to redact um, text than it is uh, video footage, and so there are a lot of uh, work right now, partnerships developing between law enforcement um, agencies and other um, uh, arms of, of government. and. Um, and, and tech people um, yeah. actually to figure out ways to blur faces and blur license plates numbers and that kind of thing to deal with the privacy part. The way our team is uh, addressing that issue is, is simply by, um, you know, uh, releasing uh, data, um, uh, you know, in, in the aggregate. So, so we, we, we take all this footage and we, you know, do analyses on this footage and then you, you, you release the findings mm -hmm. um, from that analysis. And so there's a way in which you don't have to deal with the privacy issues and, and, you, and you can still um, talk to the public about what's happening uh, on, on, the, on those tapes, how the interactions are unfolding, what are you finding. And so there's a, an accountability piece without the uh, privacy concern. Okay. Um, so there's that, and and then the the broader so, question and then, was inclusive. Yeah, and the second one is, um, I think it might be helpful just to ground your work a little bit in the broader conversation about implicit bias. So, for example, I run Google.org, Google's philanthropy. I'm a Google employee. All Google employees are strongly encouraged to take um, right. uh, implicit bias testing. I, I raise your hand. Have you ever tested yourself on on bias, unconscious bias? Okay, so a few. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, when I was when I uh, was tested, which was you know voluntary, we did it on gender. So I'm a feminist. I have two daughters in college, working woman. I tested strongly biased mm -hmm. against women in work. Um, you know, strong association with women and family and nurturing, and mm -hmm. men with work and and careers. 
Mm -hmm. um, so this is an, an unconscious bias. Right. So your work specifically is looking at unconscious bias uh, between with race and criminal justice system. Right. So so maybe for folks who are a little bit less aware and haven't done those tests, and perhaps on themselves, um, ground us in that a bit, okay. and how it relates to the specific work with police. Right. So yeah. Uh, couple uh, thoughts on that. I mean, one is, uh, you know, I had mentioned uh, that in the policing world, there's not a lot of evaluation of training, and, and, and that's the case in these other domains as, as, as well. So mm -hmm. we know a lot uh, about um, bias now and the conditions in, in which it's most likely to be triggered and, you know, how it operates, what the consequences are, but we don't know as much about how to uh, mitigate bias. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, even, even your experience with going and doing the IAT and your reaction to that, like, you know, is there a way just mm -hmm. having that knowledge um, actually affects your behavior later? Like, that, that's um, something that we know very little about. That's one of the projects mm -hmm. that we actually are working on uh, uh, with Spark is just giving people um, access to information about their own implicit bias and what yeah. do they do with that and are they motivated? Does it actually. Um, uh, re reduce bias, or could it um, you know, lead to this effect where you get defensive about it and um, yeah. you actually don't want to deal with it, and um, that could um, you know produce more bias. Um, so in, in the, the policing world, I mean, it's, it's the same uh, you know issue of just yeah mm -hmm. we, we have these um, you know we have we have this uh, training, but we don't know exactly um, what, you know what's going on with it, like how officers react to it and, and, and do they react in a way that, um, you know, when they're um, interacting with people after receiving this knowledge, is it better right. or is it, is it worse? Um, one of the things that we try to do when we talk about implicit bias to officers, though, is to talk about um, how it's, it's not um, something that's generated within, you know, it's, yeah. it's not just about, um, by, you have a bias because you're a bad person, right. <laughs> you know, the bias right. is there because of, um, you know, the um, culture we're in and the, um, you know, the um, inequalities that we are all mm -hmm. uh, witnessing, um, you know, it's, it's there also for situational, moment to moment um, yeah. reasons. And so there are uh, situational triggers of bias. Um, and, and, and you can, when, when we talk to command staff, we can talk to them about, um, you know, how there are certain um, situations that, um, you know, you know, sort of, uh, promote <coughs> bias or lead to more bias and, and how to try to avoid those situations or be mindful of those situations or they have the power sometimes to control the situations that they yeah. put their officers in and so that's the message that we give to them. Okay. So, so Josh, let's yeah. let's do a step back wider moment with yeah. you on, yeah. on your data. So we had yeah. an interesting conversation about this before the panel about you know the fact this is corporate data. So uh, you know Google, for example, cooperates a lot with researchers. So yeah. you know why don't you just speak to the pros and cons um, of of this sort of unique kind of hybrid yeah. relationship that that you have? As you say, you're not speaking for Apple, but you're paid by Apple. The researchers are independent yeah. and yet paid by Apple. Yeah. So pros and cons of this kind of approach. Um, yeah, the I. I have a pros mind and cons mind about it. <laughs> um, the pros are uh, we have access to right. large amounts of data. Um, you know, I mentioned you know 19 million observations on the production side. That was because we compressed what was uh, you know this the the amount of data on the production side from Apple is uh, it's is incredible. We also have access but it's not just apple data we have relationships with the suppliers and we get we don't get the data via apple we mm -hmm. get the data directly from the suppliers and it requires building a relationship um, with them and this is you know confident very very confidential uh, data and there's some things that they're not willing to release but we get a lot of it mm -hmm. um, and there's a potential as i said uh, for impact yeah um, the, the cons are, uh, first of all, I know this will come as a shock to people, but the data are not collected for the purposes of doing serious social scientific research. Ah. They're pre collected for the purposes ah. of getting shit done in a factory. And so, it, you know, they're kind of a mess. Yeah. Uh, the data are a mess. I can give specific examples of that. Um, uh, secondly, 
Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a badged Apple employee. Um, I, I fight hard against, speaking of biases, unconscious and conscious. But, and, uh, but if somebody, to, you know, if God came down to mm -hmm. earth and told me, you know, I was biased, and I, 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 who am I to disagree with God? Uh, that could could be true. Um, uh, we work hard on that, and though the data we're able to publish, we can't we can't share the data. Right. Uh, so on issues about replication, I am a co-author of a paper that appeared in Science a year or so ago. A year or so ago, that came out of the Berkeley Initiative on Transparency in the Social Sciences. I'm one of 18 co-authors on it. It's a strong plea for the, about the importance of transparency. We can't share the data. Mm -hmm. So your grand um, rules are: you can share the findings, but not share the raw we, data. We can share the findings, but we cannot share the raw data. Yeah. And and that uh, and I, I I've never done work like this before. I'm a right. philosopher. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 what I've learned very quickly is uh, that boy, it sure would be good to have some independent research team looking at the same stuff because it's there are lots of ways that you could yeah. recast the questions and, and uh, okay. the answers. So yeah, it's a and mixed bag. And let me ask a specific yeah. about the research itself. So. You know, help us imagine. You know, who are these workers? What yeah. what do they look like? These ones who are you know undergoing yeah. this very serious churn, and what are the what are yeah. the signals that you're seeing yeah. about whether that churn is not helpful to them? So let me give you a little bit of a snapshot uh, based, and this will be based on the surveys that we've done. So as I mentioned, we've done two pretty large surveys of about 7,000 workers each. In one case, it was done over a period of about three weeks. This was a 30-minute survey done at hire. In the second case, a larger facility, it was 7,500 people surveyed in one week. Mm -hmm. It was a slow hiring week, so they only hired 7,500 people that week. Um, so just focusing on the second facility, um, uh, it, it, it's some interesting numbers. The average age was a little bit over 25 at higher, which, is, which means that these workers are older than fast food workers in the United States. They're not kids. Yeah. Average age for the women was 26. More than 60% of the women hired at this facility were at higher, married, and 51% of them had kids. So they're young adults. They're not kids. And these are, they're employed in places where you can't bring your families, right? Uh, so these are virtually to a person, uh, people who have rural household registration and the facilities where we're doing the work are in cities. So they don't have urban huko and they certainly don't have urban huko in the cities in which the facilities are. So it's very hard to bring your kids because it's very hard to get access to social, yeah. uh, to education or social services, so the kids are probably home so with grandma and grandpa. So these are rural migrant workers. These are, or these are rural migrant workers, which goes some distance to explaining the uh, rates of exit. A, a big reason for exit, people say, is that uh, a bit, very big reason is they say they wanted to go home. And by the way, there's a gender split on this, which yeah. is something that yeah. we talked about. When we did an exit survey, Twice as many men uh, said that a principal reason for leaving was that they weren't get that they got paid more money at another job. Twice as many men as women. Many more women said that they left for some personal or mm -hmm. uh, uh, family reasons. The thing I want to emphasize is that these are they're not kids. So when Aaron Sorkin says, you know, they're you know twelve year olds who are making 17 cents an hour, he's so completely full of shit that he doesn't know, you know, I hope his head is not up his ass because he's so completely full of shit. And it's a distraction because the real issues mm -hmm. in these facilities are not, there is like five cases of child labor probably. Yeah. It's not child labor, it's not people getting poisoned, it's not people... It's that the work is incredibly boring. People are living in crappy dorms, uh, and that these are not careers. And when yeah. somebody says something like it's 17 cents an hour and it's teenagers, they're creating mm -hmm. a, a distraction from addressing the real issue. Sorry for the sermon on that, yeah. but I, I yeah. really pissed I understand yeah, you there's, get, you know, you get, yeah. there's some strong feelings and emotions yeah. up here, folks, yeah. 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 on this panel. 
Um, okay, I'm going to ask each of you um, one quick question with, with quick response, and then we're going to turn to audience questions. So, so get your uh, questions ready, and then um, the mic run will, will come around. So, um, so Jennifer, for you, you know, as I was first learning about this work, and, and Google has recently started supporting some work around systemic bias and, mm -hmm. and racial justice, you know, one of the things I got excited about when I looked at, at your early work is thinking, wow, could, could this kind of data that you're trying to capture to see if there's bias, could that actually, um, could we use um, AI to build algorithms to actually detect in real time yeah. whether this bias is happening and yeah. whether it, it might be predicted to lead to violence yeah. and then actually potentially intervene? You know, right. and, and do, you, do you see use cases for this kind of approach and this kind of analysis that might have some um, action-oriented... Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, that's, that's why we're in it, yeah. in part. Um, um, right now, we're um, trying to uh, develop a speech recognition system that mm -hmm. would be specifically designed for the policing context. And, and, and the idea here is that it would be a system that would go directly from the audio that's picked up by the, the mic um, mm -hmm. of the camera. So it would be the police officer's speech and then to um, produce a transcript um, uh, of that speech. And then um, to use um, you know these computer tools to actually analyze the, um, the the text from those transcripts to see if we can um, tell from the officer's words alone um, mm -hmm. uh, you know what's going on like sort of to, to be able to uh, make judgments about um, the arousal or the anxiety level the tension of the interactions uh, that kind of thing um, we would also be able to um, you know um, we're, we're trying to figure out ways to use prosody like the tone of the voice and the you know, mm. the, the loudness and the, mm -hmm. and the uh, rate of speech and all of that to see if we can use that to predict um, how these um, interactions will unfold as well. So the goal is to um, move towards, um, you know, automation. Um, yep. and, and, and once we do that, I mean, I, I talked in my earlier remarks about, um, you know, just uh, moving from this um, sort of courtroom evidence-based mindset to, you know, one that's more uh, like a data mindset. Yeah. But, but the other issue is just the logistics. Like, even if you want to use the footage, how do you do that? Like, how, how do you take, right. you know, uh, like the NYPD say, they have 35,000 uh, police officers in that one force. And so if they were to get body cameras, you right. couldn't possibly. So you need um, gonna, some other solution. Yeah. And so automating some process, uh, uh, we, that's where we want to go next. That's really exciting work. So, Josh, one last question for yeah. you. Um, as I was, you know, reading your, your research on the on the churn and the turnover rate, I, I, I thought, well, that that sounds similar to a New York Times article I read recently about Amazon and, um, yeah. you know, sort of a business philosophy of of having a high turnover rate and yeah. that, well, that's actually helpful for business or that's sort of our model. Um, so, I mean, do you see links with, you know, other industries and, you know, yeah. what's I the... believe in class conflict, so I think it's good <laughs> for businesses and not good for workers. Um, you know, if, 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 the, the, Henry Ford had a 370% turnover rate before he introduced the $5 day, mm. uh, $5 day, eight hour day, and it's, it dropped like a stone yeah. after that. American manufacturing in 1920, the average turnover rate for firms was um, about 10% a month. By about 1928, it was down to about 3% a month. The workers were the same. There was no change in the culture of casual work or anything like that. What happened was that firms changed policies, and mm -hmm. they decided it was a good idea to invest in longer-term mm -hmm. employment uh, And were the policies changed primarily paying them more? Uh, the policy changes include pay, included paying them more. It included uh, connecting compensation with tenure, which mm -hmm. is not true in these suppliers. Now, you get no raises. You get mm. bonuses. You don't get any raises. Mm. Uh, centralizing HR systems to make it less arbitrary. Yeah. Uh, a whole set of uh, changes took place over the 1920s that ratcheted down um, uh, uh, turnover. Last point on this, though, with two cont important contextual differences in the China case. Now, the first is the system of rural household registration, which is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. And that does drive some of the, you know, the migratory character of labor force. And the second is that this is, at least in the Apple world, uh, there's a high degree of seasonality. So you go from X to about 1.8X at the 
peak of ramp. And so when a, you know a firm says to me as that, what's the optimal rate mm -hmm. of uh, exit? Yeah, I. I First, say depends on whether it's. You're, I'm talking from the point of view of workers or from the point of view of the firm. From the point of view of the firm, it probably is something in the range of six or seven percent a month, averaged over the course of the year because of the seasonality of the work. Okay. But they're way over that now, so there's lots of room for improvement. Lots of room there. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn it to audience questions. Um, let's go ahead and start here with the glasses. And let's do quick questions so we can get in as many as possible. Thanks. Thanks for the panel. Uh, can, is this on? Yeah. So I'm also a philosopher philosophy professor, so I was kind of interested in the ethical aspects of what yeah. you, Josh yeah. Cohen, were saying. I mean, it sounded like, on the one hand, the way to um, make things better in the factory with respect to churn rate is to get people doing simpler tasks and then to ex extend the people who stay and get them doing more things, kind of a classic speed up, right? And so that's the solution. And then you said at the end that the ethical problem that you see here is that these are places where people are leaving a lot. You know, why should yeah. we should worry about these conditions? Yeah. But it sounds like the solution here, getting simpler tasks, overextending the people who stick around, also might have some ethical issues involved. Yeah, I think maybe you've misunderstood the thrust of what I was saying. Okay. Uh, if I if I understood the thrust of the question. Yeah, sure. But maybe I'm misunderstanding <laughs> you. You're understanding me. We need an algorithm to help yeah. us out. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, simplifying tasks actually increases exit. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, and simplifying tasks doesn't, it doesn't lead people to stay longer. Simplifying tasks is how you get extremely high quantities of very high quality products produced in an environment in which people are leaving quickly. I see. It's good for factory operations. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, my question is for Professor Eberhardt. It has to do with, um, I can imagine two kinds of bias. Mm -hmm. One might uh, observe in a laboratory that a subject, a police officer, more readily associates criminality with blackness. Right. But then there could be also the bias on the street where the mm -hmm. uh, police officer aware of the fact that in the background environment, there's a higher rate of black criminality, right. treats a particular black person more likely to be a criminal. So right. Are you able to distinguish between, right. um, or is there a useful distinction uh, to be drawn between those kinds of bias and would that have any operational significance? And if I can, just very quickly, mm -hmm. okay. What about the bias of the citizen toward the police officer? Right. What about the idea that I'm stopped for a traffic violation, and I assume because the officer is white that he stopped me because right. I'm black, right. which causes a very different dynamic in our interaction than otherwise? Right. And is that something that you would take seriously? Yeah, we, we definitely want to look at that as well. I mean, it's, it, it is an interaction. It's a relationship, and, um, and I think that's... You know, part of the problem when people look at this uh, issue, they're looking from one perspective or the other, but they're not actually, you know, looking at these uh, sort of people in concert and, and how they can actually influence one another. Um, so, 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 so that is, that is an issue. Um, it's also an issue for when we want to automate this. The, 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 the problem mm -hmm. with automating uh, the speech of the um, community member is that we don't have lots of samples of their speech and they're further away from the mic and there's a lot of traffic noise and there's wind and you know there's so it's it's that that's a difficult uh, task to, to to pull off um, you know uh, so and the, the, the technology is not there to pull that one off but but we are uh, close enough where we feel like we can um, actually get it pretty um, good at um, being able to uh, transcribe what's going on with the officer's speech and there are lots and lots of samples of this officer you know talking to different people across the day and across the week and across the years and so um, you know we can get pretty good at you know um, um, being able to uh, look at that, how that officer is changing um, how he's talking to people based on the race or based on the location in the city and so forth um, one other comment I'll make um, about just the um, you know, the, the sort of promise of the body-worn cameras to, to deal with that question of the relationship or the interaction is that 
so, so, so far, um, all of the agencies who have gotten these cameras, um, two things happen. And one thing that happens is that use of force goes way down. Um, mm. and, and, and the second is that citizen complaints go way down. Um, mm. And um, there haven't been, there have only been about a couple randomized controlled uh, trials, like, you know, like real studies to look at, um, you know, cause and effect here. And they, they show the same thing. Um, you know, so, so there is a, a, a strong relationship there. And, and then that begs the question, what's going on? Is it that the, is it the officer's accountability? Like, is it that the officer is just changing their behavior and then that um, determines the nature of the interaction? And so the, the person, um, you know, so that's the driver? Or is it that, uh, you know, that the community member, if they see the camera, they change their behavior? So, 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 so both actors are um, mm -hmm. sort of bringing their best selves, I guess, to the interaction <laughs> uh, because they know, it, you know, it's, it's, it's for the record or it's being uh, yeah. filmed. So it's, so it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. It's fascinating. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kim Meredith, Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. Um, we've been an anchor program at Stanford Center at Peking University since March of 2012 and had a number of PhDs and postdocs doing research on China. And clearly one of the big topics that comes up is around migrant workers, repression of protests, all of the different kinds of activities you would expect. So on the theme of informing better policy, Josh, yeah. um, and good to see you. Nice to see you. Um, it, how are you somehow clearly that Apple wants to keep its workers, um, you want to release workers who you may not want, but are you also um, using any of that political power or um, influence to also influence um, why women might be going back to the rural areas because they can't bring their children, they can't get them in schools, they can't access health care. So are you somehow trying to inform policy at a bigger level beyond Apple's borders? I'm not in uh, government affairs. I'm doing this wor work as a research project that's focused specifically on the issues of, of attrition. Uh, I don't know what government affairs is doing on uh, the household registration policy. Uh, I don't think that would be a, a very productive expenditure of time because that policy has been around for you know a couple of millennia and uh, some version of it around for. So I, I don't think it, there's going to be much mobility on it as a consequence of anything that Apple does. However, one specific thing. Um, uh, so in the place that I mentioned, where the women who start work are 26, more than 50 percent have kids. Um, there is no married. Uh, there are no married dorms. About half the workers at that facility live in on-campus dorms. There are no married dorms, and there are no places for women to take care of their kids. It's 25% women at the facility. Yeah. So something that could be done that would ha have a retention effect and by do a variety of other goods is to do something in that area. And there are conversations about that, whether that will happen is another matter. Okay, I think we have great time question, for one Kim. more. Do we have one last question? Yeah. All right, great. Um, it seems like you're focused on using measured data to inform better policy. I wonder if you see a role for like crowd judgment data, like prediction markets or so mining social media, as uh, you know, and how that compares with using measured data, you know, in uh, informing policy. That one's for you, Jennifer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I thought it was for you. <laughs> yeah, I, think it was, I think it was for both of us. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, yeah, no, it's a... Uh, uh, well, yeah. one response to that is, um, you know, there's a lot of social media, you know, with people uh, taking pictures of the police, right, with, yeah. with their um, cell phones. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's interesting. So that that's... Uh, you know, one perspective uh, with the body worn cameras, there's, a, there's another perspective, right? So you don't see the police officer at all in, in the footage. You, yeah. You're just seeing the person that they're interacting with. Um, and then with the, um, you know, usually, uh, oftentimes with the, um, the footage uh, that uh, we see on the internet through the, through the iPhones that people have, it's either more uh, information or there's, there's, uh, there's um, you get information about what's going on um, in that action, interaction from the police. And I, I do feel like we need um, 
a variety of perspectives. Like the, the perspective actually does matter for how you uh, interpret uh, what's going on and, and, and even how you assign responsibility and, and, and so forth. And, and so that is a, a huge drawback, I think, with the body-worn cameras mm -hmm. is that there, there is, you know, we're receiving that information um, from the perspective of the police officer only, and so there's right. bias kind of built into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. For I, me, I, just, yeah. I, I think it's a great question. We do, the short answer is we don't use it. Uh, we could, uh, and maybe, uh, and maybe we should. Um, it, it would be part of an effort to develop better ways of understanding. Uh, the mechanisms which we don't really understand very well now behind uh, decisions to go. So I appreciate the question. It's, for, it's a very, we should do that, yes. All right, well with that, why don't we thank um, Joshua and Jennifer for <laughs> great discussion today. And um, I think we now have a 15 minute break. Thanks.